Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, and download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and uh, really what a high honor it is to bring in a cat who is continuing the cyclical nature of rhythm, uh, doing it on the bandstand uh, as a mentor, as a teacher, uh, somebody who learned from the original masters and uh, is trying to continue on today uh, as uh, my daughters and younger generations have digital beats crunched into their ears uh, my guest is consistently trying to break up time and form, trying to inspire people, and most importantly, raise the collective consciousness of the band and the audience every time he plays live. Herlin Riley, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Jake. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, I appreciate those uh, those sentiments that you just expressed. Well, I, 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 we're just get, we're gonna have a ball. I, I know we have a game on this program called uh, Name That Voice. I, I, I want to see if you can get this voice, and then, uh, and, and then, and the content, and then we'll come back and break it down. All right, all right. You, you're absolutely correct. Oh, Calumet City, outside of Chicago. Calumet City, Burlesque, Bur- Burlesque House, unbelievable. Hard, hard work. Only you can take an admission. Only you can have an admission. If you want to, you have to play. You have to become the drummer, and he would. Or he became the pianist. There's, there's no such thing as an admission. Eight hours straight. Eight hours straight. I mean, that, um, wow. were, was it just a was it just a drums piano duo, or were you playing in a trio? What, can you paint the so picture? It was a quartet. It was a quartet. The 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 leader was a, a saxophonist, so it was a quartet. Who was the leader? I forget his name. <laughs> Unbelievable. So you were, but I mean, this was late 40s. All right, so I'm glad I nailed that one. I, mean, I wanted to, I wanted to. <laughs> Do you know who that is? <laughs> Man, that's, no, that, that, that's, that, I'm stumped with that one. Well, it's a, it's a guy that you, um, it's a guy that you know very well. His name is Ahmad Jamal. Now, I, the, 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 the recording wasn't the best. That, that was from my interview with him from June of, 2000, June of 2016. Now, I think that that's what I wanted to ask you is that were you aware? Because when I, I did this long monologue, longer than the one I did for you, and I, I just on a, on a hunch, I, I, just because all the cats from his generation did it, I said, you know, he played burlesque houses. And he said, Jake, who? Who tipped you off that I played strip clubs or burlesque houses? I said, I don't know. I just, I've been interviewing enough of the cats to know that that's what you guys did. And sure enough, he was just telling that story of him and the, he'd switch, he'd play drums, then the, the drummer would play piano. They'd go back and forth eight hours. And I'm just curious if you even knew that about Ahmad. No, he played the drums? He, yeah, that's what he, I'm going to send you the interview because, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's amazing. I've been I've been working with this man since 1982, and uh, I I watched watch him playing the piano for the past. His hands, his feet are always in time, and so I asked him one day. I said, Did you play drums? And he denied it. I mean, he, well, he, I don't know if he denied it or he just didn't really answer me directly. But I never knew that he played drums at all. Well, again, this is going. This is like sort of. This is before. This is before the Pershing, the the inn or yeah. the. You know, I mean, this is like going back in the in the day. I mean, to me, he, we had this. That's the whole idea of the Jake Feinberg show, Herlin, is that it's like um, everything is basically on a cosmic frequency. I, I go on basically intuition and instinct, and I kind of wanted you to just talk about. Um, the ability to play um, spiritual music. Uh, Stanley Clark, in our interview, he told me that he was having a few drinks with Wayne Shorter one night, and and uh, and and Wayne was like, you know, playing really spiritual music. It's not just bebop; it could be anything. He's like, it's like going to get your grandmother some milk at the store. You know, it's that love. Yes. There's this love, and I'm like, I could not ask a better person than Herlin Riley to talk about 
<laughs> you can riff on that any way you want, but but the idea of being able to transcend and play spiritual music. Well, to me, spiritual music is is really at the the, the, the essence of jazz, and and it's because it's connected to your own truth. And when you go deeper inside of yourself, there's a spirit, spirituality that takes place there. But um um, and so so in playing, you know, as an artist, you try to do the things that that's that, that's true to you, and not becoming pretentious or anything, or trying to uh, follow a formula for you know to be accepted or heard or anything. You know, it's it's about being being true, true to your own self and to your to your to your own spirit, and let let it come through on your instrument or in art. You know, whatever the art is, whether it be dance, whether it be uh, writing, whether it be uh, being a musician, but it's about it's about your own your own truth. And you know, if you go in deeper inside of yourself to bring out your own truth and you know present it and and art, then I think that's 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 a close connection to spirituality. You know, and and I think music is a, is a very very special uh, uh, art form in that that is is intangible, and you know you can't touch it, but you can certainly feel. It. It's like the wind, you know, it's, it's something that you really really feel, and uh, you know that it's present, and uh, it can it can it can change your moods. It can it can put you in different frames of mind, uh, depending on what the piece is. Uh, you know, music can, you know, it's so so very very powerful, and uh, that it, it touches a part of your your core in a way that nothing else does. And I think uh, that, that to me, that, that speaks directly to, to the spirituality that's uh, involved in, in, in this music. Yeah, well, you just threw out, I mean, I'm curious about, um, and I, I, I really want, I'm just gonna let you, the, ta- the floor is yours, but I, you, you, you go up, I mean, are you the house drummer at Lincoln Center, or do, how often do you do that gig? <laughs> Well, I haven't done that gig really since 2005. That's way okay. So it's long gone because I, what I'm trying to get at is, I mean, uh-huh. I, 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 I'm trying to get at this idea of this this truth. Uh, like you talk about, it's your truth and trying to be as authentic mm-hmm. as possible. And, um, you know, I, I, I wonder about this idea of if, if not that Winton is not doing, you know, great promotion for. Uh, for music, but I don't know. I, I, I just have a very hard time. I'm not sure how we got to a point where people now, um, instead of letting the body dance, I mean, I could go see you or Johnny or, you know, way back. I mean, I'm 40 years old, but I, you know, I, I just want to let the body dance. To me, that is ultimately the most cathartic thing. And I, I, I'm curious about how you... Um, how you deal with a, a situation where you're you're playing to peeps that are paying a huge dollar amount and I don't know if they're expecting stuff or not, but how you can really play burning music in a setting when people are sort of, we've been kind of taught to sit and stare as opposed to letting the body dance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, Depending on the setting, it's it's, it's it's um it's it's a challenge to negotiate sometimes. You know, sometimes the venues are designed for people to sit. You know, I, I you, you go to you know we was talking about Lincoln Center, and Rose Hall is a, is a hall. You go to a jazz uh, you know festival or something where it's it's, it's kind of standing standing up you standing room and. People can kind of dance and move and move their legs and kind of get around, but um, um, so the music, the music really, really inspires you, inspires one to move, you know. And if you're in a, a, a setting where you're in an auditorium, even if you can't, maybe, maybe you won't get up and dance, but you would definitely get be clapping your feet or clapping your hands or nodding your head or something. You, there's there's some kind of reaction to the music that's going on, you know, around you. So, um, you know, so it's a different kind, of, depending on the setting. And, you know, music has, you know, so many different functions. And, you know, there, there are functions where, where the music can be in a parade or something where everybody's dancing. Or, you know, music can be where, you know, where you, you're, you're in another kind of setting where you're just sitting and listening and observing. But, um, you know, but when the music speaks to you and that truth thing comes to you, and you, you just can't help it, but you have to move. 
your body. You have to move your hand, you know, move your, bob your head or clap your feet or snap your fingers or something because the music is moving you. It's, it's testing you in a way that makes that's motivating you to, to react to it. I I, compl- I I guess I'm just more of like an idealist where it's like I, I don't care how abstract the music is or free. Um, it's just, to me, it's become a healing thing. And it does talk about... Um, I remember Kofi Burbridge, rest in peace, beautiful cat. He told me that, you know, it's like the some kind of chemical gets set off in the brain and it goes into your body and just heal, when you hear music, it just heals you. And it's it's kept me incredibly, and it didn't, it didn't always used to be like that for me, but I guess, can you talk about the the most free setting that you, you were born in 57, if that's, if Wikipedia is correct. And I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm curious about- right. You know, the idea of uh, if you could take us back to a time in your career when you didn't have, there were no set lists, you weren't necessarily the leader, but it was the most organic, free musical setting that you played in, and then ultimately how it kind of helped your ears grow on the bandstand. Well, I still play in settings where where there's no no set list, there's no script, we just play music, we just come together and play. And, you know, in doing those times, you know, it's, it's it's an organic kind of you know moments where that happens. You know, when you're just coming together and you know, and you everybody is bringing their own personal truth to the music, but it's it's in a way that's done whereby um, we're, we're we're all listening to each other, and we're communicating, and we're having a dialogue. And you know, and sometimes when that happens, um, there are magical moments that 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 takes place, and those those are the moments that that are really really special. You know. Um, when, when, when everybody is on the same plane in the same sphere, you know, with each other, and, and, and we're playing together, and there's this magic that takes place. You know, that happens. You know, I'm in New Orleans right now, and, and that happens all the time. I was just in a band, uh, just in a rehearsing, rehearsing for the Jazz and Heritage Festival that I'm doing uh, this weekend. And um, so we, we we had a spot in the moment, and then we rehearsed just now. We were playing. And, you know, we, you know, we kind of got off script from the from the, the page, and you know, we just started playing together and there was a moment in the re- rehearsal about 10 minutes ago where the music was so magical and so it felt so good and um those are things that that's that's is like as, as you said music is very very healing sometimes you, you go to a, a playing music sometimes you don't feel so good but when you finish playing and finish hearing or whatever you feel a whole lot better you know i, I speaking on that i did a panel discussion on the, on the power of and once, and before I did the discussion, I was shown a film that was called Alive Inside. And in this film, um, a man was um, he was he had Alzheimer's and you know and uh, dementia, and he was just sitting in the corner, just kind of just just sitting there like a vegetable, just sitting and you know not even engaging with the world around him. And the nurse came and she put a headphone on his, you know, some headphones on on him. And she plugged in some music that was um, of his of his youth, like it was like Jimmy Lunsford or Count Basie, the early you know. Early sure, yeah, years, sure, like sure, that. sure. And yeah. this and this man, he went from being in a ve- in a state of vegetation to, to to you know, with his eyes kind of got wide. He started you know kind of um, smiling and you know he started engaging again. And they played the music for about a half an hour. And then after that, you know. The lady was able to talk to him. He, you know, he was able to engage in the conversation. So the music kind of turned on that switch, kind of re, kind of reignited him to to come back to reality. And uh, that was the music of his. The music brought him back. You know, it's just he, those headphones and that music of his of his youth brought sure. him back. So music is very very healing and, and it touches you in a way that that hard to it's hard to explain. Well, that's what I want. I mean, because, listen, you are, uh, you know, because music is unquantifiable and because we live in, the, in a very data driven time, um, how are you working with not even working with younger cats, but how is the significance of music changed in our culture? Because you go back to the days. I mean, there were gigs in New York, you know, prior to the escal- escalation of like real estate and the insanity of cost of living cats could play like you know pizza parlors six nights a week you know a few sets i mean people could get, could get by they could get ahead in some cases if you were in a major metropolitan city that had a, had a thriving 
studio scene, you were going to really get ahead. It, to, it, Dizzy and Miles, they were never millionaires, but they were always looked at and revered for their genius, and they were paid okay. Now we have a situation where, because of, of the unquantifiable nature of music, and sort of this saturation of material that we have on, on the internet now, there's just so much out there. You have situations, I want you to just kind of riff on these two situations. People that are, you know, people, younger cats have to pay to play or they play for the door. To me, it's very humbling that um, you work on your craft and maybe you're bringing some original new material to the table and yet the first question someone's going to say is, well, how, how, how many people are you going to bring in? Are you a known name? Yeah, it's great that your Journey or Steve Miller or Tower of Power, that they're, they're playing oldie hits. I'm talking about like younger cats, new music vocabulary. How do you advocate? What do you tell them? Or how did you do it so that you're not paying to play or playing for the door? To me, it's, a, it's kind of a, a cynical way of looking at this. What we've been talking about is just completely healing stuff, which is music. Well, you know, this, this, the whole industry has changed. The whole the whole scene, music scene has changed. You know, when I was young, when I was a younger man, I, I I could go and I could play in clubs. I I would play a gig at night and get off at maybe at, at midnight or something, and then go and catch another set that was starting at two o'clock in the morning, or catch a set that was starting at three o'clock uh, in the morning, and people go until the sun came up. You know, and in clubs and that kind of thing. Those kinds of scenes, and also, you know, being when I was younger, I, I got the chance to engage with a lot of the older musicians who were playing at those hours, you know, and um, so there were venues, and there were, you know, that that, that allowed you to, to grow and develop, and also, not only were there venues, there were there was an audience for you to play to, and um, so you know, so the music scene has definitely changed. You know, uh, people are still supporting music and still listening to music. But then we have we have other things that's challenging us, challenging us way that uh, takes us away from the music. For instance, you know there is so much going on with the internet and and uh, you know uh, movies and you know television and you know there, there there are other things that kind of takes us away from takes our attention away from music and music music development. And um, and so a lot of the younger musicians now are growing up and um, they're they're getting their the rudiments of music in the classroom and from academia, and um, and so sometimes you know the truth, the the truth, the truthful aspect of it sometimes is missing because they learn all these skills and learn all these riffs and stuff, you know, from academia standpoint. But how to apply it and how to how to um, uh, put it in, you know, insert it in the way in the music that's that's that that will be touching and that that will that will uh, you know that would that would like like ignite uh, ignite something in them. so you know those kind of things have have, um, have changed over the years and so um, um, I don't know you know I don't know what the, what the answer is no the, and there are no right I didn't no, there, I just love that you're 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 riffing on it I guess what I'm trying to say is there are no right or wrong answers on my program it's just you know what you just said was you're learning all this this theory you're learning the scales you're learning this you're learning that but you're not learning your own truth which that says to me that's why there's like a homogenization of sound i remember i did two interviews with bill cosby before the world caved in on him and he he was (laughs) obsessed with elvin jones and tony williams and Max Roach, he, I mean, he loved what they stood for, and he also wanted to be a jazz drummer, but you could literally put a blindfold on him and put on any Blue Note record, and he could tell you Pete LaRocca from Mickey Roker to Max Roach. Everybody had their own sound. That's what I hear when you're talking about, when you say yes. your own truth, you're talking about who you are, and and yes. that's what's missing in academia today. So. I, I guess, let me ask you, I'm just going to go through these, these names here. Uh, John Boudreau, Ed Blackwell, James Black, Idris Muhammad. Did you have a chance yes. to hang with any of those cats? I'm sure you did. And talk a little bit about them. Okay, I want you to, if you I, go through I, each one, tell me a little bit, like the special, to me, my show is built on the continuation of how real music is made. Herlin, please talk to me. These guys are the shaman cats. So go. the floor is yours. Well, all the people that you named were, were, were drummers from New Orleans, and um, 
when I was growing up as a little boy, I had my, my uncles were musicians, and uh, they had a group called AFOs called All for One Band, and uh, they 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 recorded. And um, one of the drummers was John. Well, the drummer who, who was in that band was John Boudreau. And uh, I can remember being a little boy. I was maybe five or six years old and hearing John Boudreau play. And um, he, he played. He played so clean and so. Um, it was just clean. He played clean and, and precise, and but really swinging and and, and uh, driving. And so uh, I got to hear him as a little boy and get to be influenced by him as a little boy. And uh, I lost touch with him because he moved to California. And um, in in my in my teenage well, I, actually I was before my teenage years. He had moved to California, so I kind of lost touch with him over the years. But then I re- re- reconnected with him, you know, years later. But uh, he was one of the one of the great drummers of New Orleans. Smokey Johnson also was one of the great drummers. He wrote the tune "It Ain't My Fault," you know. And, wow! Um, wow! He, he, yeah, um, yeah. James Black, you know, he was also a drummer and a writer, and I still play some of his music today. You know, all these drummers were, you know, um, you name someone, some. Yeah, no, Ed, 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 Ed Blackwell. Ed Blackwell, he played, you know, he, he, his, the sound of his drums were, wasn't like anybody else's drums. He, he used, he put some, I think he used uh, casket heads that he put on the drums that made his drums sound more like, like, like African hand drums as opposed to just <laughs> conventional uh, uh, drums. Yeah. So he had, he, he had his own different sound. He, 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 uh, he had, Worked a lot with Randy Weston, who, um, who, who had spent some time in, in, in West Africa. Oh yeah. And um, and and, and uh, Ed Blackwell had, had had also spent some time in West Africa. So he, he had a whole kind of African sound to his to his to his drums. Um, you know. So you know, and I got to hear all these people. The artists they had their own identity and their own sound, and, and which is which is I think what what you're talking about is one of the key ingredients that's missing in in, in development of jazz today. People, you know, developing their own sound. You know, when you talk about piano players, you know, there there are 88 keys on the piano, and you know, Thelonious Monk sounds different from Duke Ellington, and Duke Ellington sounds different from Oscar Peterson, or Oscar Peterson sounds different from Ahmad Jamal. You know, all these people have their own identity on the piano, which is the same 88 keys. So, you know, how do you develop that kind of that kind of identity? You know, and that's 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 you develop that by going further inside of yourself. As opposed to looking outside, trying to emulate or trying to pretend that you know to do something else that you heard before. Did did I just want to be clear? Your your mom was part of a group called AFO, or was it part of Harold Batista's label AFO? It was ha- part of Harold Batista's label. You know, um, my uncle Melvin was uh, also he was he, he was, my, was my uncle, my, my oldest, my mother's oldest brother, who played the trumpet and. Um, he, he he and Harold Batiste actually formed that group together. My uncle died in, in 1972. He was 42 years old at the time, so he um, he didn't get the acknowledgement because he died so early. But he was a, he was like the one of the founding. He was like founding I cannot believe this is okay. this is why I do my show. I just want to. I, this is so important. So you're saying your uncle's name was what was his full name? Melvin Melvin Lasty Melvin Lasty Melvin. Lasty. Melvin Lasty. He played with Aretha Franklin. He, yeah, he played with uh, Willie Bobo. He played with King Curtis. Um, you know, you know, he has. He he, he did a lot in, you know, in, his, in his short time, in his short career. But his name was Melvin Lasty. Yeah. Melvin well, no way. I mean, I. Mel. Okay. So, because I'm just the 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 first. This is from Ellis Marsalis. Uh, my interview with him. He said. Mm-hmm. Harold had a Harold Batiste had a vision that eventually led to us recording some of the original music that we were producing on the AFO label. Um, and That's right. Peter Peter Beatty, a, a bass player who another great bass player, Richard Payne, and then Harold and Alvin Batiste. And so, I, how, can you can you talk about uh, you know ultimately? Like your mom had a had a kind of a, a, a could you talk about the group she had and well, the, and what what kind of music it was? Well, my mom my mom didn't really have a group. My mom my mom my mom she played piano and she played organ and she sung, uh, but she was more more into gospel music. She didn't really do secular music, and she well, you know when when my uncle Melvin died, she had two other brothers who played uh, David Lasty and Walter Lasty. Walter Lasty played the drums. David played the saxophone. 
and they kind of pulled her in to kind of play a little, you know, do a couple of secular gigs, but she, that wasn't where her heart was. Um, my mom m- mostly stayed close to New Orleans, and and um, she mostly played in church. She played in church all of her life, you know, up until she passed away uh, in, 17, in 2017. So, um, so she wasn't really on in, in the secular on the secular scene, but my uncles definitely were, and they they were they were her brothers, and they kind of got me involved. Also, my aunt, my grandfather was um, was a drummer too. My grandfather played the drums with Louis Armstrong at the Waves Home in 1913. Uh, wait, I'm, so, wait, um, wait, wait, tell me his name one more time. His name was his name was Frank Lassie. Yeah, Frank. Well, he was the one Frank that. Lassie. Yeah, Frank. Okay, I mean, Frank was the one who played drums at at that at that church, right? I mean, that's. At, that's right. That's right. The whole Lasty family. Right. I just was interviewing Cyril Neville about that. He used to go. He used to go. He said here, um, I got to find this quote because it's so classic. Um, I would walk. He said, I would walk. He goes, My mother was Catholic. My father was Methodist. Even uh, every now and again, uh, we would go to the Catholic church, which to me was work. I would walk from the 13th ward all the way down to the 9th ward just to stand outside the Lasty Church to feel the vibe coming out of there. The whole Lasty family played in that church. You can't get more spiritual than that. The focus of the yeah. worship was on uh, Father Blackhawk. They had a statue of a black Indian. To me, that was way closer to who I was as opposed to being a, ca- a Catholic church where I could barely understand what the man was saying because they were talking in Latin at that time. The mass was in mm-hmm. Latin. I couldn't understand anything. Um that church continues to come up over and over and over again. And when I spoke to Joe Lasty, he was talking about, um, you know, just the modified trap set that your grandfather played on. I mean, can you, what are your, what are your earliest vi- visions and memories of the, and the magic? Because that's really where the, the cats were falling out of the pews and stuff, you know? That's right. Well, that was my first, my first, uh, engagement with the drums was in the church you know my grandfather frank lasty he played in the church and i was you know i was brought out I, I was raised in the church basically and um so uh when he got up that's how i learned to play the tambourine that's how i had the whole tambourine skills and all those things from being a little boy raised in the church but my grandfather played in the church and i couldn't wait till he got up from the drums to, to sit down and play but during that time it was um it was more like it was akin to i guess uh like a holiness church or um it was a spiritual church but you know um but but there was a lot of music a lot of music, a lot of stuff going on and and uh even when i was a boy i, I saw people shouting and people passing out in the music you know hearing the music and they were just kind of just getting so so entranced in it they would kind of pass out and they'd have to put smelling salt you know to the people to the ladies nose or to the guys nose. No, i love but, this but, i love this who got the Holy Spirit and passed out, and I mean, and I mean, some some people look at this as a, uh, you know, some, something mystical or something that's, you know, but I, I experienced that myself, and I saw people who were actually out, out. I mean, literally out, like knocked out, and they just, and then you know, you put some smelling salt, and sometimes they, they would they would smell it for a minute and not even react, but then they just kept doing it, and people kind of then they would kind of wake wake up, but you know. But I saw this, and I, you know, as a child, I, and I experienced this. And so, my first engagement with the drums was was was, was engaging in the in the church and, in, and engaging in those kind of that kind of atmosphere. And I think that that has influenced me in my career. That um, over the years, that my grandfather always told me that, you know, as a drummer, one of the most important things is to to, to be able to play time and keep time and keep a groove, keep a beat, and. Um, and to not let it go, and I've I've seen it where, whereby, you know, the continuous rhythm and the continuous um, groove has an effect on people. Where um, I lo- so no, you're I, you are a hundred. I mean, I mean, I you're nailing this, dude. It's 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 essential. But the thing is, the thing is this. I, I, so, I mean, what what do you do about the thing about that your grandfather was saying? It's you, 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 as the human being, you have to keep the groove. You have to keep pulse and time, and you also have to keep tension, get the tension release. That was all being done by a human being. And now you have yes. situations now where, like, 
you know, I remember talking to Rick Murata, the drummer, and he's he's in one room and he and he hears someone or something going on some some drums going on in another room and he's like that's got to be a machine and he walks in and he's got a human being playing the machine parts and it's like yeah you know and and so the the rhythm that's what i'm saying the, it's it's about keeping the rhythm round rounding it not the vertical up and down that's the when you get it round that's when it becomes hypnotic that's what you do so well i mean is and and that yeah. to, you know that to me is like a major issue with the homogenization of sound is that you can't really um I, I think it goes back to the 88 keys thing before it's like why are you trying to comp somebody when you just have to be yourself i think that that's the biggest yeah. crux of the issue and i'm not sure to me you talk about the smelling salts thing that goes back to to me correct me if i'm wrong but i mean that the spiritualism of the drum the power of the drum and what those parishioners were going through goes back to their parents uh, that were in Haiti that came over from diaspora that was how the music was was a savior for them yes 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 I agree I agree but you know I also you know we have to understand one thing all music all music starts with rhythm all music starts with rhythm if you if you if you you know, for those of you who understand what a, what a, what a landline is, you know, if you pick up a landline, <laughs> and you, you, you know, you hear you hear a dial tone, just long tone. And um, but if you call someone and the line is busy, then you hear bum 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 bum. So when you hear, when you start to hear this rhythm, then it kind of makes it influence you to want to move, want to <laughs> dance, or to you know do something with that. You know, so you know. So that's that's just a rhythm that that kind of starts and then it builds from there. All all music starts with rhythm, and so and one of the most powerful act, I think the reason why rap music has sustained for so long is because of the rhythmic content. It's all rhythm, you know. It's all rhythm. You, you, you hear you don't hardly hear any kind of um, melodies or changes in, when you hear rap music. You just hear a groove and you hear somebody rapping against the groove. So he's playing. He's playing. He's he's intertwining. He's putting his rhythm, the rhythm of his voice, on top of whatever the ground rhythm of the, the drums and you know whatever those machines or whatever a, a drum machine or whatever loop is. You know, it's a, it's a rhythmic bass, and then he puts he puts his stuff on his stuff on top. And so the rhythm, the rhythms are so so powerful, you know, in the music, and um, you know that thing that's that's that that has been the sustaining quality of rap music. Over, over the past 30 years or so is it is it the, the okay but but there's i mean Herlin riley or johnny vadakovich or max roach or you know uh i don't care who it is i mean there you you go to a set of of uh melodic improvisation or improvisational music there's rhythm there too but is it just sort of the all i hear in rap music is just a repetitive theme in rhythm it i don't mm -hmm. there's no breaking up time and form so are just people just is it, it here's the bottom line phil ranlin i don't know if you're hip to, to the, he's a trombone player uh from detroit uh and he he just and i think he was talking about it as it relates to pop music today uh but he said music today is made for pacification uh it's not made for burning i only want to burn that's all i care about is burning i mean i, I to me it's the most important thing and so, I mean, I understand that there's different, you know, clubs and there's different settings and some ple people sit down here and there and that stuff. But um, with rap music, is it is it just the condensed rhythm, simplicity, formulaic sound of rhythm? Because there's you're not you're not hearing, you know, like four way coordination on rap tunes. I understand. Uh, you know, what? It, he, he, this is what he was talking about, is that. um that music, the significant, he was talking about, the, and again, I, we'll, we'll, we'll relate it to, um, we can relate it to anything, but what he was trying to say was, it's music where, it, music is now made for multitasking, uh, it's made for background, it's it's not, it's, it's not intended for the spiritual experience that it once was. You would go, Art Blakey would say, you know, my job is to wash away the dust of everyday life for the patrons that come in and see my show. So you have all these distractions now with, and you know, that's technology. It is what it is. But 
um, they don't want you to feel. They don't want you to feel is what I'm trying to say. I mean, you can the rap stuff. I, I I'm not an aficionado, but I'm saying they they really. When I listen to Hampton Hawes, when I listen to these, I mean, you can almost you can feel some of that angst when John F. Kennedy pardoned him. Okay, and got him out of the last pardon JFK ever did was Hampton Hawes. Ahmad Jamal, you can like it's it's their truth. You can hear that truth. Well, you know, but you know, you know, you know, this is Jake. But you know, the point is that we're all free will agents, and we can we can decide to engage with whatever we, we wanted to engage with. I did. Whether that be Hampton, whether it be Hampton Hawes or Tupac Shakur, you know, we we could engage with whatever we want to engage with. And, we can engage with whatever feeds our spirit, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever feeds out, feeds us, feeds that thing that's inside of us, you know, um, you know, and, you know, there's, you know, so if we can, if we, we can engage with whatever we want to engage with, and so uh, we have choices to, you know, and now today we have so many choices in music, there's, you know, so many kinds of different kinds of music, and, you know, and certain, there are different kinds of music that speaks to each, each and every one of us. You know, I, um, as musicians, and I've come to realize that that um, when you get to a certain level in your craft, it's a it, it, it's about um, it's not about who's the best or who's who's better than this one or that one or the other the other one. It's about if you if you reach a level of of expertise in your craft, whereby you become a riper. It's like riper fruit, you know. And you know, once the fruit is is ripened, it becomes sweet. And who's to say that a sweet peach is better than a sweet pear? A sweet, a sweet <laughs> I dig, man. I, dig. I like. I like how we're jousting on this right now. I mean, it, you know, it, yeah. it, 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 I'm not saying that there's. I'm just. I'm not even trying to be a naysayer or dubious. I just. I. I see the current social, uh, socio political times that we're all living in, and the continued oppression of many people deprived of civil rights. And, you know, I'm just saying that I when I just feel like jazz, especially I just if you just want to separate that out and I hate using genres, you know, Gary Bartz was going to Juilliard, but there wasn't a jazz curriculum. Things were being made. up. I'm just trying to figure out what what is your what is your philosophy as it relates to how new musical vocabulary is created on the bandstand. I, I bet you probably do it sometimes in a completely subconscious way, but I, I've asked Ron Carter this, you know, Stanley Clark. You know, rhythm sections are basically, um, they can set the table, they can be res partially responsible for creating new vocabulary, but but it's only if the soloists bring those kitchen solos to the bandstand. I, I just want you to talk about new musical vocabulary. Well, well, well you know, this music is about about having a dialogue and having an engagement and having a so you know so um, the change happens when people are you know are listening to each other when you when you're listening and you're having an engagement you know it can be sparked by the by the, the horn for the soloist or it can or it can be sparked by something that happens in the rhythm section you know it, it doesn't there's no set person who who, who would determine the direction. Now, once you know, once, once something, once once an idea is, is planted, and once you hear something, or you hear, something and you want you, re, you react to it, then once your your reaction will spawn, will, 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 will influence somebody else's reaction, and then when they react, then then we got a whole other kind of groove that's happening. You know, we got a whole another 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 vocabulary, and I think it, the vocabulary is developed by engagement. You know, by engagement with other, you know, even though you, you know, everybody comes up with their own ideas, but you still, when you when you present your ideas to, it's just the music, that's the language of the music. We having a dialogue, you know. Um, what when did you I when did you get hip to the, how early was there a defining moment? Was it with your granddad? Was it when you, when you got hip to the idea of of the conversation in music? Um. I had to be like in my uh, in my twenties, my my yeah, my like in my twenties. I started working professionally in my you know when I was nineteen because I had a family. I, I already had a family. I got married when I was eighteen, so I, I started working. I was already playing music. I never had a job. Music has been my only job. Wow. So in my twenties, yeah, yeah, in my twenties, 
um, I got to play with a lot of, you know, I was playing with a lot of people who, who were in their 60s and 70s. And um, and so they would always um, talk to me about, you know, my role, the role of my instrument, the role of my instrument and the role of their instrument and understanding that. And especially, you know, growing up in New Orleans, we know, you know, we had um, polyphon- you know, polyphonic horn sections where, where they just polyrhythmic, I would say, where everybody would play... Um, would engage playing their own kind of solo, but like, the, but they had different rules. Like the trumpet plays the lead, the trombone plays, the clarinet plays sings over the lead. He plays like, uh, uh, you know, a high, a high obligato part over the, over the lead, hmm. and then the trombone plays that's plays in the bottom where he's can to the to the bass or the two, you know, but he's he's bridging the the bass or the tuba to the you know with the melody and the trumpet. So he's right in the middle, and so um, the piano is outlining all the all the chords and the structure of the of, of the um, of the piece of the tune. Through, he's outlining that through the chords, and also playing, you know, engagement with, with little, you know, nuggets, you know, that you know, and also so now the bass. The bass is playing with the drums, playing time with the drums, but also the bass is bridging with the piano. Exactly. The chords with the piano. So you know, everybody has a role. And I started understanding those rules when I was in, in my twenties, and um, and so, so, so then sometimes you know as a, as, a, as a as a musician as a composer sometimes sometimes you break you, you break the rules of the roles, and so you know sometimes you you know sometimes you have instead of the trumpet playing playing the lead sometimes the bass will play the lead, you know, and so when you but, but you know but having those having those understandings, you know you can kind of engage you no know, to you know how to um you know to manipulate the music well no, and, and 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 then also ultimately you know have have a dialogue and and and, and call and mm-hmm. response and and you said it was polyrhythmic or polyphonic was that kind of like just sort of like was who, who was who was who was introducing that kind of stuff was it different from the other yeah. like other music that other forms well, of jazz well i think it's polyrhythmic because everybody's well playing a solo I, I mean, I, yeah, everybody's kind of playing a solo, you know, at the same time, but um, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm using the right term for that. Where well, everybody's playing the same solo, they're playing playing like in New Orleans traditional New Orleans music. Everybody plays at the same time, but everybody is, is is playing in a way where they're playing a solo, but they're still playing with each other, and that's kind of polyrhythmic or. It, yeah, yeah, I'm, polyrhythmic. We'll, we'll, we'll we'll get the right word. I I want to we got. One more, one more. Name that voice uh, for you, uh, okay. and then we'll, we'll try it. We we'll try it. Yeah, well, we're, I think I think you're gonna get this one. This better, better, better quality here. So hang in there. Here we go. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I tell you one thing about that. That was uh, we would my wife and I were doing some research at one point. We went into the Amistad Center at Tulane University, looking oh, into some so historical cool. stuff, and uh, found so some old cool. newspaper articles. And in one, there was uh, uh, an article during the slavery time saying that a law had been passed making it a crime punishable by death for a slave to be caught with a drum. Wow. Wow. Uh, and, you know, because of that, you know, what had happened in Haiti. And, right, uh, right. You know, the, yeah. Right. And, and their fear that the drum was, the, uh, you know, their communications network. And that's so, yeah, they can't... can't you know that, that's how they would get together and uh, uh, be able to get enough of them together to maybe overwhelm the oppressors. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Uh, but you're but when you say these well, these uneducated Europeans would come to the state, you know, I mean, I've I've done some. I mean, we're just kind of connecting for the first time, Herlin. But I mean, I, I I've been I've gotten an education behind the microphone talking to the. To all the cats, uh, Tootie Heath and and you know Ahmad and, and and you're right. That was the late great horn horn player Charlie Neville, and uh, Bill Summers as well. And you you start learning about these guys like Toussaint Louverture, and you start learning about uh, cats that were uh, that the that you just start to realize our cultural history as a country and and. I asked Billy Cobham this the other day, and you know I'm going to ask you too. Is that have you always have you been interested in pursuing, or have you accomplished the American dream, or have you accomplished Herlin Riley's dream? 
Well, I'm still living my I'm still living here in Raleigh. Absolutely, but I mean I mean we hear that all the time. The American dream, the American dream, the American dream. No, no. And that's not really what I mean that's what, go ahead. Yeah, I don't I don't know what that is. I'm living Hurling Raleigh's dream. Uh and the most important thing to me is uh is finding peace in my life. You know, and that's peace in my music, peace in my finance, peace in my relationship, peace in my health, peace in and um uh, everything around me. And as long as I can find that, um, then I I'm, I'm living a dream, you know. Uh, I, 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 as a, as a musician, as a, as a child, I, I, I always wanted to be a musician. Um, I saw my uncles, my, my grand, well, I saw my grandfather's a musician, but I saw my uncles who, who were on, you know, my uncle Melvin was the only musician. He, that's all he did. And I wanted to be him, be like him. He, he was my mentor. And I've lived a life now where, where I'm still living a life where I, I've, I've only had, I've only been a musician. All my life, I've never had, a, had never had a job. I raised five children. I have ten grandchildren, and um, you know, I've never had a job, you know, other than playing music. And so, to me, that's living a dream. That's I'm very blessed in, in the fact that I can, and I'm still playing music. I, I'm still engaging in music. As a matter of fact, I was just um, my CD. I just my, my fourth CD as a leader was just released on Friday, uh, April twelfth, and um, Last week it was, it was number one on the jazz beat charts. It's called Perpetual Optimism. Wow! Oh, yeah, and, right, uh, right, 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 right. Yeah, and so and and I'm, I'm living. I'm I'm, li- I'm a living example of, of trying to be optimistic, you know, and 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 have you know. So I'm 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 living Herlin Riley's dream, the American dream, whatever that is, you know. For those who want to engage in that, power to you. But I'm I'm living a personal dream. Well, okay, I'm going to ask you how because. There are pitfalls that are set up for people in society, especially people with uh, black skin. And I'm curious how you avoided mm-hmm. those pitfalls because they're there. I mean, that's what Cyril was saying to me that, you know, basically, uh, you know, if you jump in the water and you swim across this lake and you get to the other side, then you're going to make your dream. And when you find out when you get there, there's more hurdles to get over. I mean, it's always kind of rigged. So, You've avoided that, and I, I just would like you to talk about how to younger cats, how to stay humble, how well, to stay on the righteous path. But ultimately, was there a time when you were, when there was a fork in the road, and you could have made a, a wrong decision, but you made the right decision? Absolutely, that was you know that life is a series of forks in the road, and you you know a series of choices that you have to make. And uh, fortunately, I you know I've. I, yeah, I've been fortunate to have made some good choices in my life. I wouldn't say they all have been right, but that I, I you know, I would say I, I've made some good choices. But the fact is, you know, I think you avoid pitfalls when you don't when you don't don't become um, seduced by the carrot. You know, somebody want to dangle a carrot in front of you, dangle some, you know, we're not seduced. You know, somebody want to dangle some money in front of you, and you know that this is not good money. What? what? You know, I don't need I don't need to have that money. You know, it's not that you know, I've been very blessed that I don't have to do certain things. I'm I'm not I'm not going to be seduced by I dig you know I dig certain things. You know, I I have, I have my own truth, my own peace, and that's what I want. And um, you know, I like I like nice things and like like to have like everybody else, but uh, um, I can't let that be defining define who I am find what my character is you know and i think and when that happens when you when when, when people can play to you with with with, with a carrot you know with with, with this you know if you, here's this million dollars if you do this do that do that do that. Uh-uh. i have you know i gotta live with myself i gotta live with um i i have to be an example for my children and also for my- did you um did you have a situation early in your life? Did you have a situation earlier in your in your life when you were when they dangled a carrot in front of you and you said, even though you kind of in the back of your mind said, "Am I crazy to reject this?" That you said no to it. Not really. Um, I had values in my life. First of all, you know, as, a, as an adult, I've been I've been I've been a parent all of my adult life. My first child was born when I was nineteen. 
and um, and being a parent, I was I'm, I was responsible. So um, there are some things where I, you know, I felt like I had, I had to take care of my responsibility, the responsibility of raising my family. So opportunities were were, were there for me to like move to New York or move to, to L.A. or to, you know to 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 do you know to I mean there were some things there were some opportunities that that people were yeah I guess they, I guess people would say that was a character for me yes that was but my value was you know to raise a wholesome family to you know and uh, I want you know yes I, I'm a musician and I, I you know I want I, I'm continuing to be a musician but um, my value was with my family and so uh, I sac I maybe I've sacrificed a few few dollars. But to have the hopes of this is to have a family, and that's you know, and even to this day, my wife and I are still married for 42 years, and all of our children, are, you know, are together. We really, I have a I have a wholesome family, and I'm very very blessed that I have a family and a career. You are and totally family. blessed, man. I mean, to 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 have a soulmate. I mean, I I have two daughters, and they changed my life fundamentally forever. Just they help me. Uh, I mean, they, on so many levels, they help me dream again. Um, it's just, we're, you know, what is your, con <laughs> so I just, I mean, the point is that the birth, when you were that young, the birth of your first child was life altering for you. And you realized that this was your mission was to support your family and, and be, uh, be around and not be absent from their lives. And that's just like. I mean, I can't tell you how much I, I respect it, and, and I can relate to it too. But before I let you go, um, uh, but, you know, I tell you, I, go ahead, yeah. I, I just want to, yeah. I just want to just, I, you know, being in New Orleans allowed me to do that because I don't know, if, you know, many cities. I don't know, I don't know if many cities where there are musicians who actually make a living uh, playing music. So being a young man and being here in New Orleans, where this is a tourist-driven industry. I mean, a tourist-driven uh, living living condition. Absolutely, in yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, and so, as a result, people want to be entertained. So there's music always happening. So there's music. I was I played in hotels. I played in clubs. I played. You know, I was working six or seven nights a week. And I don't know of many places in the country where musicians can work a steady job like you know six or seven nights a week. Uh, sometimes I work. Yeah, sometimes I work seven nights a week. Um, and two or three jobs a day sometimes, you know, and, and, and making a living. So New Orleans have, you know, being here in New Orleans played a great deal in my, you know, my decisions to, to not leave. I figured I could make a living. I could do okay. I could, do, I, I could, I could but the main thing was keeping my family together. And that's, that's why I stayed now. And New Orleans allowed me to stay because it, because of how it, how it helped, you know, how it served me. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think Jazz Fest starts this weekend, uh, or very soon. Um, you're, mm -hmm. are you, uh, actually, I'm going to be down there May 2nd and 3rd. Are you going to be in town? Are you going to be playing at all? Uh, May 2nd, I'm playing, I'm playing on the 4th. Uh, I'm playing at a place called the Prime Example on the 4th. The Prime Example, yeah, no. Um, what, what time are you playing? I'm just curious. You know what it is? I just, I would love to come uh even co come and just catch it, grab a cup of coffee with you um i'd love just to come meet you in person uh, because this is uh, you did an amazing job today herlin of um like really just talking totally about staying like in the moment but really basically bringing things into the present and the future and not really uh i don't think i i didn't get one you you didn't tell me one story from back in the day, which is really amazing. I mean, you really you did it naturally. It's incredible, and I I don't even <laughs> I don't even my show is not about preservation, but um, I just feel like we're just getting started here, man. And I you know I'd love to yeah you know, I'd love to connect with you if you're around at that time. I'll be down there for a couple of days. Okay, give me a call. Just give me a call, and uh, you know I'll I'll see I'll see what the schedule is like because I'm, I'm kind of moving around. This is a kind of busy. Herlin Riley legend of new orleans very grounded and still playing and still being a family man that's it for the jake feinberg show see you soon creature from another time 
It inspires the baby's questions. What's that? For their mothers as they ran. But no one stopped to think about the babies.